around the world. I'm your host, Xin Yu Zhang. I'm glad I have co-host Shell Marines with me today. I'm uh, so pleased to have Maria Snake via the columnist uh, with me on the show. We will talk about the serious role, uh, Russia's role in Syria. Can you please introduce yourself? Uh, good afternoon, my name is Maria Snegovaya. I do my doctorate at Columbia University and I also publish a lot in Russia and work as a daily columnist at Vedomosti, which is the largest business daily in Russia. Now is, uh, you know, Russia's role in the series kind of hit spot. Um, how has Turkey and Russia's relations changed after the fat jet incident? Uh, it's a very good question and it's important to uh, mention that to understand the Turkey-Russia relations look at what the actual initial Russia's intentions in Syria were, right? So the clear purpose that everybody seems to agree upon is that Vladimir Putin attend, attempts to back uh, Bashar Assad, the current president of Syria, to keep him in power. That's why uh, since the beginning of the Russian bombings uh, or in Syria in September this year, we've observed the interesting scenario in which the uh, formal, like, the official purpose of these bombings to attack ISIS actually is not is not exactly it doesn't look like that's what Russia is doing there. In fact, according to different estimates, only ten to twenty percent of Russia's bombings hit the uh, ISIS groups. Uh, all the other, the largest share of these bombings hit completely different uh, uh, groups of the population in Syria. And one important group, uh, which is being under attack by Russia, is the um, actually directly relevant to Turkey uh, case. That's the uh, Turkish, uh, Turkey-related population that uh, inhabits the borders, the frontiers of uh, with close to Turkey. And these groups were initially in the position to Bashar Assad. So since Russia has been bombing particularly those oppositionary groups uh, with uh, quite a significant intensity, uh, uh, those groups immediately started to, of course, to immigrate to Turkey. And in general, their positions have been weakened substantively as a result of the Russian bombings. And hence, it's really not comes doesn't come as a huge surprise that uh, Turkey ultimately was so annoyed that it actually counteracted by uh, hitting the Russian jet, which is in turn really uh, currently turns out to be quite detrimental for Turkey-Russia relations. So we've been observed in the last um, weeks following the downing of the Russian jet, huge, huge worsening in the relations between Russia and Turkey, which is quite ironic or at least surprising since actually Turkey is the largest uh, trade partner of Russia. According to different estimates, it's third or fifth largest trade partner. And Russia has been like very eager to introduce different sanctions against Turkey, to ban certain products, to ban even travels of the Russian people to Turkey. Like the whole tourist industry will definitely collapse in Russia as the outcome of these bans because Putin officially signed a decree, a decree actually prohibiting the Russian people from traveling to Turkey, which if you like think about that, quite, is quite ridiculous. But that doesn't stop there. In the last two weeks, Russia has also intensified substantively the bombings of the very population in Syria, which actually, as I said, um, led Erdogan to down the Russian jet to begin with. So Russia keeps pushing its uh, kind of uh, its uh, goals, its purposes in Syria, and uh, has at least in the last week has been signaling that it's not ready to stop, despite the uh, what Putin has been calling aggressive behavior by the Turkish side. So I read your article. So do Russians really support bombings in Syria? So what is the, the public opinion in Russia about the military um, uh, aggression? So it's important to point out that uh, when we talk about Russia, we're, we're talking about a non-free society, right? A society in which the majority of the TV channels are under the state control and uh, hence the, the state controls to a large extent the content of the information that Russians receive 
because over 90% of Russians trust TV station, TV as the main uh, source of news. So then, having said that, basically the state has a lot of control over whatever Russians think and feel about the uh, military engagement in Syria. And so there are basically this argument that I uh, advocate on this last Huffington Post piece of mine is that because of that kind of state control, it's quite easy to persuade Russians of whatever Putin basically decides to do next. So if he wants to go to Ukraine, in two months you have majority of Russians supporting the military intervention to Ukraine. If he wants to go to Syria, in a month, you have majority of the Russians supporting the um, uh, intervention to Syria. If tomorrow he decides to chill to come to Mars, I wouldn't really be that surprised that in a couple of months we get majority of Russians supporting an invasion of Mars too. But it doesn't really mean that that's what the Russians really think. Um, I don't think so. And the reason uh, is the huge swings in the public opinions of the Russian people. So basically, as I said, in early, early September this year, you had about 60-70% of Russians opposed to military intervention in Syria or any kind of military help to Bashar Assad. In October already, just a month later, you had majority of Russians, again about 70%, supporting the, the bombings of Syria, right? How do you combine that? So this is quite a puzzling kind of question and I've been speaking to many, many sociologists and analysts in Russia. So the majority suggests uh, that the answer is that fundamentally an average Russian really doesn't care about whatever is going on, right? So we have more or less stable share of so-called hawkish people with hawkish, hawks, people with hawkish uh, position on foreign policy in Russia, that is like about 20%. And there's also 10% liberals, people who think it's better to be peaceful and to negotiate things peacefully. But the absolute majority over 50% are people who are largely indifferent about whatever has been going on because they have more important things going on in their lives, right? Such as their incomes, I know their family problems. But because they don't really care, they tend to be those exactly those people who support whatever they listen on, whatever they hear on the TV station. So imagine Russia engages in Syria. Next day you have this public, huge public broadcast on one of the main TV channels saying, where hosts are saying in a very aggressive way how important it is to right now help Bashar Assad in Syria and actually count to the United States because in Russia it's also quite important to point out it always against the United States. Whoever Russia is fighting with, be it Ukrainians or Syrians or Georgians, Ultimately, it's only about the United States because this the United States is backing those people. That's the presumption. So you have this broadcast in a very aggressive way. Uh, people are being persuaded that it's really important to do now. Uh, and when asked in a week later, a week later, when asked what do they think about uh, the current foreign policy of the president, they tend to support it. But in fact, it doesn't mean that they really, really support it like when they have this fundamental uh, beliefs inside of them. What it rather means is that, they just, is that they just tend to repeat whatever they just heard on TV stations. So they do not, for better or worse, they do not really incorporate those feelings. Um, and how do we check that? Is by asking a side question. So for example, if you're um, interested in how a person really feels about Syria military engagement, You'd ask this person, uh, for example, would you send your uh, your son to go fight in of Syria or not. in Ukraine? <laughs> yeah, and not surprisingly, as it turns out, no one is ready to send the uh, the uh, relatives to die there. So that's a very important thing, and that actually also applies to pretty much every single dimension of the Russia's foreign policy and the Russia's nationalism. So people tend to support those slogans because they're so great, because they show that Russia is a big power and is basically standing up of its knees. But when asked the more specific questions aimed to uh, check how mobilized Russians really are on those dimensions, right? So are you ready yourself to go fight for those? Things or are you ready yourself to suffer economically as an outcome of these actions of Russia? They tend to say no. So I'd say mm -hmm. it's a good thing ultimately that they do not really, really believe in these things. 
speaking to the media control in Russia probably is about the history of the media. Uh, Sean probably has good questions yeah. about the history. Yeah, we want to follow up a little bit with that because, as you know, during Soviet times, people tended to distrust official state sources and tend to ignore them or believe exactly the opposite. It, it was a, it's quite a paradox. So, what what you're saying now is is this represents quite a historical change that people are accepting. Uh, state-owned media sources, and do you, do you have any kind of explanation for this kind of kind of change or this this shift where official state-owned media has has uh, become so prominent in in people's opinions? Um, yeah, it's actually a very good question that a lot of analysts right now in Russia are struggling with. So first of all, again, it's probably a good thing that lately, in the last couple of years, the overall trust in the public television and the state controlled media has been declining. So it dropped from like 70 to about 50-40%, right? But for some reason though, we do not see that being immediately reflected in the support for the state authorities, right? So even though a person may say that he or she doesn't trust uh, the NTV or RT or RTR, these are the biggest yeah. channels, TV channels in Russia, they still tend to support the overall uh, behavior, as I said, of the Russian authorities and the rating of Vladimir Putin, most importantly, is still very high. In fact, uh, following the uh, uh, Ukrainian adventure last year, uh, the rating of Vladimir Putin has been amazingly stable. This has been pointed out by many sociologists, so it wouldn't fluctuate, it kind of got stuck at this level of 80 to almost 90% approval, which is like, as you can imagine, remarkably high, especially comparing to the democratic ratings. On the, on the positive side though, that particular rating is not exactly what uh, you can't really directly compare that to Obama's rating. It's slightly different, given that there is no alternative in the Russian politics. Either way, so, uh, but nonetheless, what does this trust in the media uh, mean? So first, uh, important thing is that in Russia, the media is not that controlled. Like, ultimately, there's a lot of, uh, the internet penetration is relatively high. It's one of the highest in the world, right? Uh, many people have access to the free information on the internet. So if you really want to, you can't get it, right? The same goes uh, if we talk about... Uh, so, wow, we could yeah. wrap up the first section. Yeah. easy to tell which kids have trouble with their eyesight. But that's not always the case. Even though one in four children may have a vision problem, eye doctors tell us the symptoms aren't always so obvious. We do know that 80% of all childhood learning is visual. And without good vision, kids can have trouble learning to read. And may fall behind in school. For clues on how to spot the real life signs of childhood vision problems and what parents can do, visit checkyearly.com. A public service message from the Vision Council of America and reading is fundamental. on the world. I'm your host, Xin Yu Zhang. It's co-host Xiao Marin with me. Can you just go ahead make a comment on the last question? Hello. The, uh, two questions have to, uh, two, uh, two answers uh, are important to um, basically answer that question. First of all, the, although the state TV media, TV channels are under control by the state, the uh, internet and radio access is still relatively free, so a really willing person in Russia can still access the information. So that's why the uh, basically this this is unlike the Soviet Union, where pretty much every other channel of information has been blocked. So unless you were listening for BBC, 
very secretly through special devices that would allow you to access to those registration. It was very hard to get uh, in touch with the outside world. That is not true in Russia today, and that illusion of transparency definitely enhances trust in the available information flows. That's actually quite remarkable the way it works. And secondly, it's also important to point out that the recent politics by Vladimir Putin plays into the post-imperial syndrome that has been uh, basically that Russia has been suffering from in the last years following the collapse of the Soviet Union. Uh, in Russia, the collapse of the Soviet Union has been largely perceived as the failure of the geopolitical project and uh, failure of the national identity uh, because the new concept of nationality of nationalism did not evolve to replace the old one. So when Putin does all this quite crazy, to be honest, things by going to Ukraine, to Georgia, to Syria, in a way that kind of re, um, recreates in the, in the minds of the Russians this perception of the greatness of their country. Something that they really want to feel because the, there has been a void uh, at the, there following the collapse of the Soviet Union. So in a way they hear what they want to hear. The, the propaganda on the state TV channels plays into that void, plays into that desire. And that's because, you know, as a beautiful woman, if you say to a beautiful woman, she's a, or not very to any woman, she's beautiful, she's inclined to believe that, right? That's the way it works with the Russians too, because they kind of, they are given the reality they want to believe in, and hence they're more likely to believe in it. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's interesting. So, so yeah, and, and I, I also look at uh, what would president would you do if you were President Putin with economic sanctions, political sanctions, you know? And, and sometimes you think, well, maybe uh, is, is is he just being overprotective and and showing the xenophobic nature of the Russian character uh, by by closing down media outlets, but um, or or maybe maybe have the sanctions that uh, imposed by the U.S. and EU has that help justify, help, help Mr. Putin justify greater uh, media controls. It's a, it's a good uh, point, but I'm on, actually I'm on the side of those people who think that Russia should have been punished for this major violation, right? That remember that the sanctions were imposed following the annexation of Crimea, and in particular the downing of the Malaysian uh, Boeing MH17 uh, by the pro-Russian separatists in Ukraine last year. And uh, you know, you just can't leave this kind of huge violations of the international law unpunished. So, plus, uh, there's quite a lot of kind of evidence on the Russian side that it, the sanction did kind of lead to softening of the Russian stance in Ukraine. And uh, Putin didn't go further because uh, Russia got, was essentially cut off the, the capital markets uh, following the downing of the Malaysian plane. Uh, and it was a major blow for the economy which was further intensified by the collapse of the oil prices a little bit later. But nonetheless, uh, it did kind of feel, it was felt by the Russian economy. And right now you see Vladimir Putin, by the way, trying to reincorporate Russia into the Western community to reestablish this alliance with the West, with a goal partly to abandon the sanctions. Well, we know that, right? Italy, for example, so you know that actually this week the EU has finally agreed to extend the sanctions for another half a year, but uh, there's definite, definite uh, signs that uh, some countries have been lobbying uh, in support for abandoning those, those sanctions, such as Italy. Those countries turned out to be like those, you know, notorious friends by Vladimir Vladimir Putin. So it's Hungary usually, or Italy, or some other country like that. So that means that Russia is suffering from the sanctions and its, and its leadership is trying actually to do its best to abandon them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so and on the, on the point of, uh, of oil prices, because obviously the pet, petro state that Russia is, it requires uh, better oil prices. And, and so what, what do you think is behind that? And, and how do you think Russia's actions in, in Syria uh, may have impact oil prices in the future? Um, the first question is what is behind the, the following oil yes. prices? Yes. yes. Well, we know Worldwide. definitely the one big reason is the huge change in the shale industry in the United States. Uh oh. Contemporary is outdated all all types petro states, right? Because the shale industry has become possible definitely due to the free market and this uh, innovative, like free innovations that are 
the lifestyle of the, um, the, the which are characteristic of the American uh, economy. On the contrary, you have that fighting against those big oil petrostates, all autocratic, all kind of de hugely dependent on oil, and also countries who tend to become aggressive once the oil prices are high. Um, so we see right now that Saudi Arabia and other um, Middle Eastern oil exporters are reluctant to cut off their production of oil. That the behavior that they usually, what they usually used to do in the past, in order to uh, increase the prices back. And the reason is they realize it's not a sustainable policy anymore because that way they will lose uh, large shares of the oil markets in light of this. Uh, incoming shale industry. Uh, and uh, that's a very important new development that means that in the future we might say goodbye to this very concept of the petro states because the oil markets will become much more competitive than they used to be. Uh, but uh, so in Russia though, uh, until very recently, the state officials tend to pray for the high oil. They do everybody like the, uh, the highest level vice presidents of Luke Oil, for example, or Sechin, the head of the Rosneft Corporation mm -hmm. in Russia, they would all keep saying that the collapse of the oil prices is very temporary and that the oil prices will get back because that's something they want to believe it. Only recently, finally, we see that they start understanding that the oil prices are not getting back anytime soon. And that actually would actually means quite very big bad, bad things for Vladimir Putin in the long term, because the economic growth is not coming back to Russia anytime soon. That is a combination of the low oil prices and also extremely bad investment climate in the country, which is a direct result of his policies. So. Having said that, um, in general, given that resources are shrinking uh, for the country's economy, I would be, expect the country to become less aggressive in the long term because this just no longer it doesn't have any more resources to fund its really aggressive and ambitious foreign policy. Uh, on the contrary, however, if the regime is really threatened with the survival, if the bad economic situation continues. Uh, the regime may also might get crazy because if you like look at the systems such as South African apartheid, when the systems are about to collapse, this is when the, the worst possible things happen. Uh, they tend to stay in power no matter what and no matter whatever it takes because they have nothing to lose at this point. So that's a little bit of a dangerous situation. That's why I want to have to keep in mind. Yeah, well, it's, it's it's very surprising because the, the the Middle East is so unstable right now that you know it's 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 hard hard to believe that there could be any more instability. I don't think the Middle East has has been this unstable since the breakup of the Ottoman Empire nearly a hundred years ago. So, and uh, yet we do not see we do not see that being reflected in the oil price. That's really remarkable, unusual. And by by the way, I do think that one of the reasons why Russia decided to engage in Syria is exactly to enhance the, that instability and which would in turn inflate the oil prices, right? we we'll just a reminder that Russia is backing uh, Bashar Assad that is directly, goes directly against the interests of the other large oil producer and exporter that is Saudi Arabia, right? So ideally, like creating this kind of conflict in, we, in which Saudi would be engaged very dramatically should influence oil prices. But that is not happening and uh, it's hard to predict, but so far we don't see that. Partly because the structure of the oil exports have, have ch has changed so dramatically, as I said. Yeah, yeah, and I think with the with the fracking industry, it's 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 a very tough situation because I don't know that it's economically viable at this low a price uh, of oil. You know, That's thirty, forty dollar barrel oil is, is makes makes fracking uneconomic. And, but on the other hand, you have the Iranian oil now that is going to be, it's making it onto the market. And then it, it appears that, that, that all this looting that ISIS is doing in Iraq and Syria, Syria is not a major oil country. I don't know that you would call them a petro state, but what little oil they have ha is being looted and, and shipped out onto the world markets is, at, at highly discounted prices. So uh, uh, by, by solving the ISIS problem, uh, perhaps that's the way the Russians view 
getting the, the, the price of oil back up. Uh, you know, I don't know, again, that the Middle East can be any more unstable um, than it currently that's, is. That's very possible. And uh, actually, this, the whole Saudi strategy, strategy the, the very reason why they do not actually cut off their production is they, they hope that they, this, that way they'll, they're going to kill the fracking industry. But that's not, that, importantly, that's not a long-term solution because the fracking industry will die for now, but it will re burn in the future, so to say, first. Uh, second, uh, some analysts, really good oil analysts, which I'm not, unfortunately, they say that the only reason to inflate the oil prices right now is to put stop on the major traffic of oil. So the areas where the traffic of oil occurs, be it uh, on the sea uh, land, um, most likely in Bosphorus, and that is not happening right now. That's unlikely to happen for the moment. So oh, wow. I mean, I'm so surprised with your insight. Uh, we have one minute live. I have a very interesting question about Trump and Putin. Sure. So Putin <laughs> called the Republican president candidate Trump a very bright, talented man. And Trump has repeated praise the Russian leader's toughness. And Trump also said he would be able to cut deals with him. Do you think that's is a mutual talk or is a political talk? Give me your opinions, just left, uh, 20 seconds left. So there's definitely a lot of psychological similarity between our two leaders. And it's also true that Russia has been uh, very often known to back the nationalists, uh, like the so-called crazy of the European politics. So it's quite uh, possible that there might be certain kind of links in between Trump and Putin. At least I know for sure there are links in between high level of Putin establishment and Tea Party. Uh, but either way, I think there's just more than that. It's just a psychological similarity between two leaders. Plus, Trump is kind of playing at the, you know, he's playing as challenging the mainstream and seeing wow. the main. That's quite interesting. Thank you for being on the Thank show. You. See you next Thank time. You Thank you for watching. Bye bye.